people are watching these uh, videos. I don't know whether it's on our site or on YouTube or whatever, but we're getting like 200 views in two days on these Darshan videos. Yeah, yeah. So somehow or other people are watching. It would be nice if you would, uh, you know, join us live. That way you could ask your questions. Of course, you can always email me or post a comment on the site uh, to ask a question. But um, no, it's, it's more fun for everybody if you're here while it's actually happening and you can ask the question in real time and get an answer, some kind of answer. Uh huh. Maybe a wise guy answer. But uh, no, it's very, uh, it's very uh, interesting and exciting for me to get good questions during the darshan. It allows me to gauge the quality of thinking of our students. So uh, sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's, it indicates when there's a problem. So tonight, I want to read from the Nectar of Instruction, continuing our series, text 8. Tanna marupa charitadi sukirtananu smrityo kramena rasana manasi niyodhya Tishtan Vrajetar Anuragi Jananugami Kalang Nayeda Kilamit Yupadesha Saram. It's a beautiful, beautiful Sanskrit. Translation The essence of all advice is that one should utilize one's full time, 24 hours a day, in nicely chanting and remembering the Lord's divine name, transcendental form, qualities, and eternal pastimes, thereby gradually engaging one's tongue and mind. In this way, one should reside in Braja, Goloka Vrindavan Dham, and serve Krishna under the guidance of devotees. One should follow in the footsteps of the Lord's beloved devotees, who are deeply attached to his devotional service. So this indeed is the essence of all advice. What's that Sanskrit? Upadesha sara. Upadesha means instructions. And sara means the essence or the core. The, uh, the, the thing that makes something what it is, is the sara. So the, the essence of all instruction, what, what is the purpose of giving <coughs> instruction? Uh, why, why do we give instruction or why do we take instruction? It's so that we can advance and benefit, so that we can approach the objective or the purpose of human life. Not merely to acquire knowledge or uh, various uh, social privileges that go along with being a knowledgeable person. Uh, some people like to collect knowledge. It's almost like they have a little storehouse up in their heads and they, everything that comes in, they want to label it. Huh? Oh, this has so much value and this other fact has so much value. And this other thing, oh, this is not so valuable. But this one, oh, this is very valuable. <laughs> Why? because it can be traded for prestige. Uh, some people like to throw around big words so that they can impress others how intelligent they are. Actually, they're not very intelligent. That's why they think they have to throw around big words <laughs> to be regarded as intelligent, because that's not intelligence. Intelligence means knowing how things really work. The actual function of intelligence is discrimination. Memory, which is what is required to throw around big words, is simply a function of the mind. And the mind, as we know, is more or less of a machine. It's sort of like a computer. And yes, it's very nice if you have a good memory and you can memorize all kinds of facts and figures and stuff. 
But that's not really the purpose of human life. The real purpose of human life is to surmount all material problems and attain complete self-realization. Because that's the cure for all suffering, the solution for all problems. We don't want these material problems. We don't want to have to take birth and then change your body again and again. Uh, even from uh, a fetus to a baby to a youngster to a child to a youth to an adult to middle age to old age and then die and take another body. We don't want to do any of that. It's not natural for the soul. The soul is eternal. And naturally, we want to have the same identity, the same form, the same pastimes, the same relationships forever. We don't ever want to change any of these things. But we're forced by the pressure of time in the material world to go through all these changes. And they're all painful. Uh, so why do we put up with this? Well, why do we have some hope that someday it's going to get better? It's not. Uh, the material world is always going to be like that. And so we can distract ourselves with, you know, temporary engagements of sense gratification and uh, fool ourselves into thinking that this world is very nice. Uh, bread and circuses. In the old days in the Roman Empire, the uh, government kept the people in line by giving them two things, bread and circuses. Uh, cheap food and cheap entertainment. Now we have, uh, what, TV dinners and, uh, and TV itself. <laughs> cheap food, fast food, huh? McDonald's and uh, all that. And then uh, the, the vast wasteland, as it was called, of television. Well, it hasn't become... Uh, it has become even more vast, but no less of a wasteland since the time that was spoken. Uh, it's still impossible to find any intelligent fare on TV. And even if there is some supposedly intellectual debate, it's all about just fluff and image and nonsense. There's nothing, nothing of real value there. The real value is in spiritual life. The real value is in the methods by which we can overcome the problems of life. Uh, that's the real value in life. Therefore, the essence of advice, the most important advice, the best advice that anyone can give, is to relish the holy name, form, pastimes, qualities, and so on of Krishna. Krishna and his expansions uh, as the personality of Godhead is really the only thing worth knowing about, the only thing worth inquiring about, the only thing worth speaking about or hearing about. Yeah. This might seem at first like a very outrageous statement or very limiting statement. Uh, well, Krishna is the only thing you can talk about? Krishna is the only thing you want to think about? Well, that's very limited. That's very narrow. No. No. Because Krishna is unlimited. Krishna is infinite. Huh? You can't reach the limits of Krishna. Uh, you just try reading all of our books. <laughs> See how long that takes you. <laughs> and then you try understanding them. And that's going to take even longer. Huh? You could think about Krishna, inquire about Krishna, read about Krishna, study about Krishna, work for Krishna, preach about Krishna, think about Krishna, chant Krishna's name, eat Krishna prasadam, and do Krishna's work all day long, 24 hours a day for your whole life, and you would never run out of new things to do. Never. This culture is so rich, is so vibrant, huh? it's so amazing. Just ask any of our students. We made one course, huh? the introduction, the, be the beginner's level course, right? And we opened up that course, what was it, like six months ago? And nobody's even halfway through. <laughs> nobody's even a quarter of the way. Maybe one person is, a, maybe Mike is a quarter of the way through. What do you think? Yeah? So maybe one, one, our fastest student has gone through a quarter of the course in six months.
We didn't intend it. To, you know, it's not like it's full of busy work or something. It's just that this is the minimum stuff you need to understand to actually get what, what this tradition is talking about, to actually get what the esoteric teaching is about at a very basic level, what to speak of a higher advanced level. But we're trying to talk to people at all different levels because we know that in the future there are going to be many students who become advanced. Uh, but the same advice is good for all of them. As he says, one should utilize one's full time, 24 hours a day, in nicely chanting and remembering the Lord's divine name, transcendental form, qualities, and eternal pastimes. Uh, this is the best thing you can do with the rest of your life. I'm speaking from experience here. I'm not just, you know, uh, this isn't 